afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have any opening statement. The uh, chairman has a briefing and then we'll go right to questions. No, thanks, Mr. Secretary. Uh, two things. One is uh, this is Military Appreciation Month and for all of us who have the privilege of wearing the uniform of the United States of America, uh, thank you to all of our fellow citizens. Uh, the outreach over the last several years to all of us in uniform, uh, regardless of people's feelings about uh, the conflict, uh, has been incredible. And uh, the notes and the emails and the letters and the care packages and all the concern is deeply appreciated by all of us in uniform. We thank you all for that. And second, uh, this Friday, as part of that uh, month, is uh, Military Spouse Appreciation Day. And uh, for all of us who have uh, spouses who support us, um, they truly are the incredible hidden strength of our armed forces. Uh, when we go overseas, uh, they stay home, they worry about us, they pray for us, uh, they keep our families together. And when we come home, uh, they pretend like they had nothing to do with it and stand in the background when we get awards. Uh, they serve this nation as well as anybody who's ever worn the uniform. And all of us who have military spouses want to thank them publicly. Thank you, sir. Bob? Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, you mentioned that General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker uh, plan on giving you a an assessment by September on where things stand with the surge in Iraq. Um, will you by that time have an alternative approach, uh, sort of a plan B ready in case your assessment or the President's assessment is that it's not working? And, and also, uh, Joe, Joe Pace, you mentioned this morning that you have uh, issued no orders to direct uh, contingency planning for a withdrawal from Iraq. Uh, I'm wondering why not? Is that not a possible contingency that you face? Well, I would say that, um, first of all, I, I suspect that whatever the evaluation in, in September will not lead to uh, a precipitous uh, decision or actions, uh, but would point us in a new direction, uh, or uh, either because the surge is working or because uh, the evaluation is the, that it's not. Uh, I said a couple of months ago that uh, I would be irresponsible if I weren't, if we weren't doing some thinking about alternatives. Uh, but I would say that uh, I think it's honest to say that there's no detailed planning or consideration of uh, any kind of uh, operational alternatives at this point. It's more of just a, a broader conceptual thinking. What would you like to um, That may, that that probably will depend on how I th how I think things are going uh, on the ground. In my main point this morning really has to do with the fact that the system we have in place has already deployed and redeployed over a million men and women, and it's capable of surging up and surging down. Uh, so when the senator asked me, did we have any orders out to bring everybody home, uh, no, we don't have any orders out to do that, but the system is in place to increase or decrease as needed. Orders. I mean, a plan that would be what you consider a contingency plan on how you would do it if you were asked to do it. The question this morning was, did, I, did we have a contingency plan in place to bring everybody home all at one time? And my answer to that was, no, we do not. Uh, that we, What we have is a system that would, would accommodate that if, if we needed to. I, I would elaborate on the General's answer to this extent to give you s sort of an appreciation of my comment about it wouldn't lead to precipitous actions. It will have taken us five full months 
to strengthen by five brigades just because of the nature of the logistics and getting the equipment on ships and things like that. So this is, this is a mammoth undertaking and uh, <coughs> the Department of Defense, like a dinosaur, has no fine motor skills. We don't, has, whether it's budgets or logistics, we don't, we don't do things with a huge amount of agility. Secretary, uh, you told uh, Senator Byrd that you didn't know if the congressional authorization passed in October 2002 for the war in Iraq is still applies today. Uh, I'm wondering if, in in light of that, uh, first of all, you can elaborate on 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 that. But but in light of that ambiguity, whether or not you would be in favor of uh, Congress passing another authorization, making it clear. Uh, that it was authorizing the continuation of the war. What I what I followed up by saying was that uh, that that the president clearly feels that it authorizes uh, the actions that the action taken in 2002 uh, authorizes the activities that we have underway. My answer was largely a product of the fact that I wasn't here in 2002. I don't know what the debate was about and the specifics of the debate. I don't know any of the legislative history of the resolution and I'm sure not a constitutional lawyer. So that's, that was what was behind my, my saying I didn't know the answer. But my, my question is, given that there is some ambiguity, and I mean, not just uh, in your answer today, but others have raised the question, given that Saddam Hussein is no longer in power, given that the authorization had a lot to do with weapons of mass destruction, given that, that there is disagreement on that, would you be in favor of a new authorization that would make it absolutely clear that this is a congressionally authorized Well, I don't think that there's any ambiguity in the President's position. Um, today, also in your testimony, you said that um, it's your belief that Al-Qaeda has actually expanded its organization and capabilities. Could you tell us over what time period you mean? Because there's been an awful lot of um, uh, talk of uh, touting the fact that three-quarters of the known Al-Qaeda leadership has been captured or killed and that um, that organization was put into a, a disarray, at least after the Afghan war. So what, what's the time period that they've reestablished themselves and established new linkages in, in Africa? My, my sense of it is that it's been within the last couple of years, and particularly within the last year or so, uh, that we've seen um, more defined training capabilities <coughs> in um, uh, Western Pakistan, uh, along with Taliban, uh, safe havens there. Um, I've tried to break it out and have the intelligence folks break it out for me in three categories. Places where we know that there are Al-Qaeda cells and Al-Qaeda planning going on, Al-Qaeda organization is in place. Um, countries where there are um, terrorist organizations that are not Al-Qaeda but affiliated with Al-Qaeda. And then the third, uh, those countries where there are terrorist cells that would like to become a affiliated with Al-Qaeda but have not been admitted to membership yet, if you will. So there's kind of three different levels of activity. Uh, and it covers uh, most of the countries of the Middle East. It uh, covers several countries in Europe uh, and so on. I think the first category, Americans watching this might say, if we know where they're planning and know where they're training, why aren't we going after them? Well, we, where we get um, uh, actionable intelligence, uh, we do try to uh, uh, go after them. We have the necessary legal authorities. Uh, and and knowing, that they're, knowing that they are active is different than knowing where they are. Mr. Secretary, last week a Pentagon mental health survey team came out with its report. And it said that those soldiers and Marines with repeated deployments in high combat areas about 30% of them test positive for mental health problems. And it recommended more time off for those in high levels of combat. It said for every three months they're in combat, they should get one month off in theater. Um, and the, the team said that recommendation was not accepted. Can you tell us why? I don't know the specific reasons why it wasn't. I wasn't aware of that, uh, of that specific recommendation. I do know that uh, uh, in the report that was briefed to you all last week by the internal review group that Togo West and Jack Marsh uh, chaired, co-chaired, that uh, there was a fair amount of ten attention on uh, the mental health issues coming out of uh, uh, the war, <coughs> both and, and, and brain injury as well. 
Uh, one of their recommendations is a center for excellence for dealing with uh, traumatic brain injury and uh, um, uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, and we're looking very carefully at that. I was just at the Center for the Intrepid on, on uh, Thursday afternoon, and that may be a good model for combining private and public research and rehabilitation and care. I've been told that there aren't, uh, that there aren't enough um, mental health uh, caregivers in the military medical system, that it's hard to pay competitive um, salaries uh, for those folks. Talked a little bit about this with some of the doctors at Brook Army Hospital, which I visited um, on Friday. Uh, and so I think we have to look at all of these things and see how we take care of these young people. And as, as I said in the hearing in <coughs> response to a question from Senator Murray this morning, um, we also need to be more aggressive in getting the word to the troops that, that these, particularly some of these mental health problems, uh, are more common than we'd like with than we would like that they that they are not a sign of weakness but rather something that is treatable and that we want to be very much involved in in caring for them so all i can tell you in answer i don't know the answer to 3 months on 1 month off but we are taking the mental health um, situation uh, coming out of this conflict very seriously. But these are folks who are still in combat. I understand. I understand what it is. I, so the question is, can they get more time off? Is that something you look into? Well, one of the things that one of the things that we've already done is is arrange that that units that are deploying early or more frequently are going to get an administrative uh, uh, leave, uh, an administrative time off commensurate with the time of their deployment uh, so that they will get an extra they will get extra time off now how that fits in with this recommendation I'd, I'd have to wait and see okay. uh, Mr. Secretary as you know the Iraqi parliament is considering a two month long summer break and I wanted to ask what effect do you think that break would have in uh, showing political and security progress uh, by September well I, I uh, was pretty blunt uh, when I was uh, in Baghdad um, a couple of weeks ago uh, that in saying to those with whom I was speaking that <clears throat> that the purpose of this surge is to is to help buy the Iraqis uh, time for reconciliation and that uh, and I was blunt enough to say that every day that we're buying them for reconciliation is being paid for uh, with American blood and that the idea of, of the legislature going out for, the Council of Representatives going out for two months, in my personal opinion, was unacceptable while we were continuing to pay that price. And were they receptive to that? And, um, well, among others, the Prime Minister said, you know, the, the Council of Representatives is an independent uh, branch of government. I can't tell them what to do. But I came away with a very uh, distinct feeling uh, that uh, the Presidential Council, the Prime Minister, and others would be uh, trying to persuade the Council of Representatives not to do that. Mr. Secretary, a couple of weeks ago when there was a debate about the White House looking for a war czar, you seemed to describe it as much ado about nothing. You said that if Stephen Hadley had the time, that's what he would do. Given that J.D. Crouch is leaving, is it now time to look for a war czar again? Or as the Secretary of Defense, do you become the de facto war czar, and is that a good thing? Well, I don't want to be a czar of anything. <laughs> um, the, um, the, you know, they will, it's clearly going to be tough to replace J.D. I'm, I think everybody in the government who works national security has very high regard for J.D. and the role he's played uh, in the government. So replacing him will not be easy. Uh, I think that, I think still that, that there is a part, to, a role to be played by uh, somebody working for Steve who, uh, who can coordinate the activities of the, particularly of the different parts of our government uh, and, and sort of be uh, somebody on the other end of the phone for Dave Petraeus or Ryan Crocker when somebody's not showing up with a commitment to be, when there's a commitment to be made and people aren't showing up uh, on behalf of the president and empowered by the president to work with other uh, departments of the government to get those people uh, deployed. Uh, or find somebody who can be deployed. And I think there's still a role for that. Uh, J.D. has covered an enormous range of issues, uh, far from limited to Iraq. So I think that, uh, 
Um, so I think what we're looking for really is somebody who I, I sort of think of it as a 911 number for Petraeus and Crocker. Uh, somebody when they're not getting the kind of uh, responsiveness that they need out of other parts of the U.S. government, somebody operating out of the White House, empowered by the President, who can call up and say, you were asked to provide this number of people with this kind of a specialty, and the President wants to know where they are. You have a job that's that close to the President. You don't have a shortage of candidates willing to sign up. So have you found some good candidates? Are you looking at someone right now? or? Well, I think, first of all, um, for this kind of a, I, you know, it's a it's a problem, frankly, that I think the the administration will face in general as we go forward, um, and it's and it's a concern that I have here in the Department of Defense. There is roughly 20 months left in this administration to ask somebody to come in, to ask them to go through a uh, divestiture process in terms of their personal uh, uh, financial holdings, to go through the entire investigative process. And by the time they're finally on board to spend uh, 15 months doing the job, uh, it's a challenge finding people who are willing to do something for that period of time. And independent of that with the Department of Defense, then when you add a confirmation process on top of all of that, uh, it's a real challenge. And, and so I think that um, I think finding somebody who is willing to do all of that for, a finite, for the kind of time that's available has been one of the challenges that Steve has faced. Yeah, Question for General Case. Um, Iran's involvement in Iraq. April, we, we've now confirmed 69 EFP attacks inside Iraq, the highest level ever. Also that Iran uh, is now supporting some Sunni extremist elements inside Iraq. What's the trend line here? Is, is it going the wrong way in terms of Iran's involvement in Iraq? What do you see going on? Uh, the facts of what you stated, uh, there were more uh, explosively formed uh, projectiles um, this month than any month in the past. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, uh, all of them are manufactured in Iran. Um, so that's not a, a, good, uh, a good trend. Uh, it still, though, uh, is not possible to point directly to who inside of Iran is supplying those or who has knowledge of those. So we need to be careful about what we know are facts and what we suppose from those facts. What about Iran's uh, support now for Sunni elements inside Iraq? Why would Iran be doing that? Again, not knowing who in Iran may or may not be, uh, you could suppose that whoever it is who is helping uh, is doing so to create a turmoil inside of Iraq. Uh, to be able to uh, make it so that the Prime Minister Maliki and the Council of Representatives cannot function properly to allow either for uh, the current al-Qaeda or others uh, to be able to have more power uh, in, inside of Iraq or perhaps to have uh, more political influence uh, by other bodies. But again, I need to point out uh, that although we know where, the, where those are manufactured, uh, we do not know exactly the organization that is delivering them. Yeah. The MRAP program, the Mine Resistant Armor Program, you sent a memo last week to the service secretaries of the Navy and the Army asking them to come back Friday with a plan, an approach to accelerate uh, procurement. This is the first program you've really weighed in on, from what I uh, could tell. What prompted the memo? And also, you mentioned in it that there's, you're concerned about a wide variance in the approach between the Army and the, Marine, and the Marines in using the vehicle. Could you elaborate a little bit? Well, I think the first thing that caught my attention, uh, as is often the case, was a newspaper article uh, that indicated that uh, out of something like 300 incidents involving IEDs uh, where these MRAP vehicles were involved, uh, no Marines had been killed. And, <clears throat> and that certainly got my attention. And, and the more we looked into it. Uh, it was clear that there was a lot of interest in this. There's clearly interest in it uh, on the Hill. They've added money uh, to the supplemental to, uh, to buy more uh, MRAPs. My concern is that the rate of production uh, is nowhere near uh, what it needs to be to meet the demand on the part of either the Army or the Marine Corps. And there's several different categories of these things. Um, and uh, 
and one of the questions I had, the, the Marines had actually at one point ordered a lot more of these vehicles than the Army had. And that was the basis of my question about how they looked at it differently. My understanding, I haven't seen a piece of paper on it, is that the Army has been recalibrating its interest and has substantially increased uh, the number of these vehicles they think they can use. General Pace, you were around when you <coughs> the controversy about we don't have enough up-armored Humvees. The Pentagon spent billions of dollars to get about 12,000, 13,000 in theater. Now you have to buy a new vehicle, almost supplanting the Humvee. Uh, what went wrong? Was that vehicle not effective in the long run? Oh, I think what you have is uh, a natural evolution of uh, technology and uh, very sharp people in, in business and industry uh, looking at the problem and devising different ways to defeat that problem. And the up Humvee. Sorry? You said people, mm. sharp people in industry. So, I, know, I mean sharp people in industry looking for ways to defeat that problem or to protect us from that problem. So the up-armored Humvee and then the enhanced armor on, on, on the Humvees, same thing with uh, protective body armor. Uh, a certain uh, way to def defend yourself, then another manufacturer determines how to do it uh, with, a th with thinner and lighter. The same thing happens uh, throughout the business world as, as people tackle problems. What this is is the next evolution of vehicles that is responding to uh, the underbelly uh, attacks that, that sometimes take place. So it's, it's a natural progression, I believe, of lighter, more effective, uh, more resistant uh, armor, both personal, personal and a vehicle. But I would add to that, it, it is, it, to your point, it also is a reflection of the fact that we are dealing with a smart, agile enemy, and, and they, are, they are adjusting their tactics and their capabilities as we move along, and so you know, we have the up-armored Humvees, and they're the best we had, and we got as many of them to the field as we could. Now we have something better, and we're going to get that to the field as best we can, but these are huge vehicles, first of all. Uh, these things are about the size of a bus, as far as I can tell. And uh, is that about right? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. And, and there's, no, th th there's no solution out there that's going to protect everybody from everything all the time. What, what, you, what you try to do is you try to provide the best protection you can that still allows a soldier Marine to be able to go out and do the job they need to do. So if you put everybody, each soldier, inside of his own private M1 tank, he would have great protection, but there are still devices out there that could destroy that tank, and he would not be able to do his job because his job is not to rumble around the city inside of a tank. So you've got to find the right balance between force protection and the mission that needs to be done. For General yeah. Pace, please. Uh, one of the obvious benchmarks of progress in Iraq is the ability of the Iraqis to stand up their own security forces. Now, we get the raw total numbers of security forces, but can you tell us either the number or the percentage of Iraqi army uh, battalions, uh, more than 100, I guess, uh, the, the, the number or percentage of those Iraqi army battalions that can operate today totally independent of U.S. forces? Uh, I will give you the, the numbers as of about yesterday. Uh, there are 10 battalions that are operating by themselves as we speak. There are 88 additional battalions that are in the lead, meaning that they're on operations with coalition forces and they are leading the operation. There are 27 Iraqi battalions that are in coalition operations and they are following. And there are 29 Iraqi battalions that are uh, still forming. And when, when, when you say independent level, does that include uh, planning, intel, logistics, the whole nine yards? I'm sure that they are still receiving some assistance from the embedded training teams and certainly just like a Marine Battalion. When I was a Marine Battalion commander, when I needed help from the Air Force, I called in airstrikes. Uh, so, so it's not that you're just out by yourself on your own, but the battalion commander and his staff are able to take their unit to the field, operate in their own area of operations, do their own planning, do their own logistics, do all the things they need to do, understanding that they, they may need medevac help just like our battalions do. They may need artillery help. They may need a close air support help. Uh, from others. And are these 10 operating in less contentious areas where uh, outside of uh, Baghdad or uh, Al Anbar? We can get that. I, I, I don't know specifically. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, there is a company in Germany under the 1st Armored Division that came back from Iraq in February. They're now scheduled to return in November. That's nine months, not 12. There's also additionally several hundred 
individual Army soldiers that we've been able to identify so far that will be returning with less than 12 months, 12 time. My understanding was that the whole point of extending these people to 15 months was so that they could have this 12 months, 12 time at home. Can you explain this? No, I can't, and I'll be very interested to find out more about that. Um, there were two units, uh, that one active and one reserve, that were um, exempted from the extension because they had already been extended to 16 months. It sounds like these are different units than those. And I'm sorry? Yeah, that is correct. So this okay. is, is nothing wrong. And, and we just need to find out about that because um, we, I, I made it clear that uh, that people would not would have uh, 12 months at home. Yeah. Um, you were asked a lot of questions today about the shortage of equipment by National Guard units mm -hmm. around the country, and you explained the, the plan for replenishing those inventories. But given the the frustration expressed by the states uh, and um, the potential for a problem if there was a really catastrophic event. <laughs> Is, is there any consideration of accelerating the uh, acquisition of additional equipment for guard units? And you also talked about funding for to restore to the about the 70 by 76 percent level. Why not 100 percent? Is it is it just a question of money? What what more could or should be done there? Well, for <coughs> openers, um, as I indicated at the hearing, historically going back 10 years to well before 9/11. Uh, uh, the average uh, equipment on hand for these units as, an, as a national average was somewhere between uh, 75 and 80 uh, percent. <throat> in the last few years, it's been around 70 percent. This year, it drops off, or in, you know, this year, it drops off to 56 percent. <coughs> what I told Senator Mikulski uh, was that we're prepared to sit down and take a look at this and, and look at it on a state by state basis. and. Uh, and see if there's more we should be doing, uh, and if there is a way to uh, to make sure that the capacity of the National Guard to respond to uh, disasters at home uh, is what it should be. Now, the the piece of this that that uh, did not come out in the hearing is that thanks to uh, General Blum. Uh, there are cooperative arrangements in place so that, for example, in the case of Kansas, they could have drawn up, uh, drawn on up to 70,000 National Guardsmen in the surrounding states, in the neighboring states of Kansas, plus all of their equipment. So their capacity to deal not only with one disaster but two or three is there because of these cooperative arrangements uh, that General Blum has, has uh, worked with the Adjutant's General to create that allows them to uh, bring additional equipment in and so on. This is what happened after Katrina with the National Guard and, and surrounding states. Uh, the National Guard has paid, the National Bureau has paid particular attention to the cap capability of the National Guard in the eight states that are hurricane prone uh, in terms of their equipment and, and whether they have the capacity to respond and, and are paying attention on a priority basis to ensure that they're able to do so. But what I indicated to Senator Mikulski is we're, we're perfectly willing to sit down and look at this and, and work with the states. We understand the concerns of the governors. Uh, they're legitimate concerns, and, and uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that the Guard is able to respond. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, that's right on. Thank you. Well, I guess I mean, the key point is just one of those. I mean, can, I mean, is this acquisition of equipment being put on a faster track, or can it be on a faster track, or is this, is this basically as fast as you can go? Well, I, that's the question I don't have the answer to. Uh, we have, as I told the, as I told the Senate committee, we have um, uh, 22 billion dollars for the Army Reserve, Army National Guard alone uh, between 2008 and 2013 uh, for equipment. We have several billion dollars in the 08 budget. We have a total of something like 32 or 33 billion dollars for all of the Guard and Reserve. So if General Blum is up there saying our overall unmet need is $40 billion, uh, we're talking about sums of money that are actually fairly close to that if you take the 32 or $36 billion, depending on the time frame that, uh, that you have. All I'm saying is uh, I'm willing to sit down with people and see if there's some way that, uh, if it's necessary, that we can accelerate some of that. Uh, this morning you talked about uh, achieving a bipartisan agreement about troop levels in Iraq. 
Uh, I wonder if you could expand upon that a little bit more about at what time, uh, how soon does this sort of agreement need to be reached and, and what, can, what needs to happen in Washington to try to reach an agreement given the... My, my formative experience in Washington was a, an unwritten bipartisan consensus through nine successive presidencies on how to deal with the Soviet Union through a policy of containment. There were huge disagreements over tactics whether if you want to call the Vietnam War a tactic uh, but or the Korean War for that matter but how to deal with Soviet Union more emphasis on arms control more emphasis on an arms buildup but fundamental the fundamental strategy on that fundamental strategy there was broad bipartisan agreement there was never anything written down about it and I don't think that there needs to I'm what well, I'm not I'm not talking about some kind of summit where everybody sits down and signs up and says this is the strategy for Iraq going forward but I think rather a, 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 a broad bipartisan agreement that for, on two points. First of all, that it's important to defend this country uh, again on the extremist 10-yard line and not on our 10-yard line. That has big implications in terms of how our forces are deployed, the kind of forces we buy, the kinds of relationships we have internationally because it means we're over there trying to deal with the problem, not over here. The other part of it is that in a country that's been through the problems that Iraq has had, um, the fact that there is probably, assuming we have some kind of a long-term strategic agreement or security agreement with the Iraqi government uh, that acknowledges their sovereignty and so on, but still provides the uh, assistance of some level of U.S. troops in Iraq for a protracted period of time, whether that's 25,000 troops or what that number is, I have no idea in terms of intelligence help and logistics, um, air support, who knows what it might be. It would have to be worked out with the Iraqis. But in terms of providing a stabilizing presence, particularly given uh, the behavior and attitudes of Iran on the eastern border, the Syrians on the northern and western borders, uh, and the overall instability in the region, my view is, my personal view is, this is, would be a stabilizing, uh, have an, a stabilizing effect and I think it's something that uh, we need to talk about. Obviously, it's a matter where the Iraqi government has a big say as well. Secretary, Last question. Were you yeah. surprised to read in the Washington Post this morning the headlines that said that commanders in Iraq see the surge going into 08? That uh, General Odierno was quoted as saying that he thought the surge would go into spring of next year. Is there a difference of opinion between you, General Petraeus, and General Odierno about how long the surge will last? I don't think so. Let me take a crack at your uh, at answering your question, then ask the general, and then we'll uh, get out of here. Um, <clears throat> I think that it's tied in with the announcement of the of the deployment orders that were sent to 35,000 troops, and that what is what they are talking about is that we have the capacity with these announcements to sustain the surge into next spring, into next March or April. One of the results of my decision for a 15-month uh, tour deployed and 12 months at home, in addition to uh, allowing us to sustain that presence for that period of time, is that it gives us the opportunity to notify troops and their, and their families at the maximum possible time in advance uh, of when they might have to deploy. They may or may not have to, but they know that their next deployment will not be before, say, December. So they know they've got seven months uh, to plan. It also gives their units time to train and, and do all the right things. So I, I think that there's a little confusion in terms of what our capacity is and in terms of what will actually be needed. And my own view, and I think the view of General Petra Petraeus and General Pace, and I suspect of General Odierno as well, is that the evaluation in September will give us uh, will be an important moment in terms of deciding whether to take advantage of the capacity that we have. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. We checked uh, with General Odierno today, uh, as you expected we would, to find out, uh, you know, what did the general mean to say? And uh, he said basically what the secretary just said, which is uh, his intent was to forecast that if needed to the decisions that have been made would allow us to keep the current surge up until about April of next year, based on the decisions made today. But the Secretary and I were with uh, General Odierno, uh, General Petraeus, Admiral Fallon about 
three weeks ago in Baghdad. We sat down. We had a very long conversation. There's no doubt in my mind that we all understand exactly how this process is going to work. We're going to get to September. We're going to take a look at where we are. So we're going to make recommendations. Uh, the Secretary and the President are going to make decisions, and uh, we'll carry it out from there. But this positions us to be able to um, either sustain or not based on uh, what the decisions are at the time. Just a quick follow-up. Is it possible that when you get – you said you, you expect to note by September, you have to at least have an idea whether it's working or not. Is it possible that in September you could decide that you don't know if it's working yet and you need more time? I don't know what will happen in December. We'll wait until – or September. 